Hi, and welcome to Terry Talks Movies. This time around, it's Science Fiction Saturday again, and I'm doing hidden gems from the 1950s once more. I've got three of them for you, and they're mad films. They are not good films. They are interesting films. They're weird, and they kind of pretend to be science fiction, but they're in a, a slightly different genre, and I'll explain that at the end of the video, because this is what we call foreshadowing. Let's get started with the first one from 1956. A movie which was produced, written and directed by a guy called Cy Roth. Cy Roth is kind of interesting because he has made such a profound impact on the film industry that he doesn't have a Wikipedia page. It's a movie called Fire Maidens from Outer Space. It's an English film with a third-rate American star, a guy called Anthony Dexter whose main claim to fame was that he looked like Rudolf Valentino and he made a biopic of Valentino in the early 1950s. After that, his career went in a direction. He did some swashbucklers and he did Fire Maidens from Outer Space, a movie which had not a large budget. One of the reasons we can tell this is there are a lot of product placements in this movie in fact there are so many that they jump out at you every time you see one here's the story just be aware it's not a very nuanced one the crew of a nuclear rocket go to the 30th minute of jupiter which has an earth-like environment now I'll leave you aside how shit the science is there they dodge a media swarm and land on the planet which looks a lot like the home counties of england it's got hedgerows it's got fields it's got vines hanging off brick buildings it's it's weirdly prosaic kind of alien planet they get some landing instructions by radio from somebody on the planet so they land where they're told to which tells us they at least know how big planets are too many science fiction movies people land on planets and they just coincidentally happen to be within a kilometer of the only civilization on the planet that kind of stuff happens a lot in science fiction movies but not in this one now they land on the planet and climb down out of the spaceship but nobody cares who steps on the planet first they just all kind of clamber down and look around a bit and they see a beacon in the distance which turns out to be a statue of a naked lady and that beacon is blinking messages in morse code they hear a scream and see a woman who turns out to be the love interest of course being attacked by a tall guy in a leotard with some very odd face makeup. But you can tell it's a black leotard because it's got zippers up the front and zippers up the back, which are visible in the movie. And so obviously this moon of Jupiter in some way has a tailor for their monsters. The monster's bulletproof, which is a real worry. But they do manage to get the monster away from the woman using gas bombs, which they just happen to have. And she takes them to New Atlantis, the sole surviving place where Atlantean civilization has kind of thrived. And the old geezer who runs New Atlantis wants them to kill the monsters so that they don't have to worry about wandering around the planet. New Atlantis is surrounded by a wall, which looks very much like a garden wall in England. And the only other survivors of the Atlantean civilization are a bunch of young women wearing tunics with very short dresses on them. They dance, of course, because in every one of these three movies, the women dance. They dance like somebody who once saw Vanessa Redgrave and Isadora. The old geezer who runs New Atlantis drugs the hero and his sidekick. The other guys stay with the spaceship and they take away their guns and then trap them in the palace. And they've got to escape from the palace, kill the monster, stop the old guy from keeping them prisoner and rescuing all of the beautiful girls. This one is crazy. It's incredibly low budget. The spaceship is incredibly cramped and it doesn't look like there's anywhere to A, go to the toilet or B, lay down and sleep. Fire Maidens from Outer Space is deeply, deeply weird. It feels like it's a movie made from somebody who'd kind of sort of heard of science fiction but knew absolutely nothing about it the spaceship itself is a v2 rocket and so you get a lot of footage superimposed of the rocket supposedly landing in the english countryside and traveling around space and part of the spaceship traveling around space is actually a cardboard cutout against the background it's one of those incredibly low-rent science fiction movies that any passionate 17-year-old could do better than these days. Now, Anthony Dexter was not a talented actor at all. 
He had the look of Valentino, so he got the Valentino gig, of course. But eventually, in the 1960s, he quit acting and became a school teacher, which was probably a smart move on his part because he really had zero riz, no charisma at all. He kind of looked like Johnny Weissmuller's stand in, in a Jungle Gym movie. The supporting cast got a couple of interesting actors, in, including Sidney Tuffler, a London Cockney using an American accent to pretend he's an American character, and the movie's trying to convince you that all of the astronauts are American, where none of them are, except for Anthony Dexter. Really dumb movie, and all of those product placements just keep leaping out at me. Uh, I think it's worth watching. I, th I think it's a silly movie. I don't even think it was the first movie where people go to an alien planet full of beautiful women. It's a trope for science fiction novels and magazines it had for a number of years before this movie came out feel free to self-medicate while you watch it because it may improve the experience but it is um low rent let's say and terribly basic but on the other hand some science fiction movies of the time were just there to fill a spot in a double feature and this movie does that as well as many other films did the reason they call it Fire Maidens from Outer Space is when the codger who runs New Atlantis is drugged by the heroes by swapping the drinks. They do the swap the drinks thing. One of the young Atlantean women decides to take things over. She captures and ties up the female protagonist, Hestia, lays her on a slab near a fire and they're going to burn her to death as a sacrifice to the goddess Aphrodite because reasons that did not happen, but it's the reason the movie got the strange name. The other major Planet of Beautiful Women movie from 1956 is another black and white epic called Cat Women of the Moon, directed by Arthur Hilton, who was a pretty good film editor for the studios in the 1940s. He edited a couple of really fine films noir, Phantom Lady and The Killers. But as a director, he was not as good as he was an editor. The movie stars Sonny Tufts as the captain of the spaceship. Sonny Tufts was not a good actor. He was born in a really privileged Boston family, but decided he wanted to be an actor and pursued his career in Hollywood. But he was not a nice man. For a start, he was a raging alcoholic. And for another thing, he liked to bite women hard during moments of passion. And in fact, he scarred up some women by biting way too hard and had to pay them off during his career. This did not make him a beloved person to the Hollywood film industry. And also the fact that he couldn't really act was a limitation as well. And he became a running joke in Hollywood for decades after this and, and turned up on Rona Martin's Laughing as a bit of a punchline. The other actors of note are Victor Jory, a really interesting character actor. I like Victor Jory in a lot of things. And after Orson Welles stopped being the voice of The Shadow, in the radio serials in the 1940s, Victor Jury took it over and was very successful, playing Lamont Cranston and The Shadow. The other person is Marie Windsor, really good B actress of the 1950s. I like her look. I like the fact that she stands up to the men as much as the plot allows her to in this movie. But yeah, she, she's beautiful, she's striking, and she could act very well, as indeed could Victor Jory. So basically, it's the first mission to the moon. They've got four men and a woman on board. The woman is actually there. Uh, her name's Helen. She's played by Marie Windsor. And she's there because she became a really good space navigator. Partly due to the fact she was being telepathically controlled by the cat women on the moon. Which is a shame because she does seem to be a competent character in the movie. So they go to the moon and she finds a landing spot which is right at the edge of the what they say they call the dark side of the moon. It's not really the dark side of the moon, it's the far side of the moon. And very scientifically illiterate people back in the day thought that the dark side of the moon was a literal thing. Just looking up at the sky now and then would tell them that the sun does shine on both sides of the moon. This movie doesn't know that. So they land on the moon and the grumpy captain played by Sunny Tufts starts getting all shouty and giving orders and acting kind of irrationally and unnecessarily harshly. If we didn't blunder ahead and start a war between the worlds, it's no thanks to you. No thanks asked. Which makes me think that he might be related to Brian Donnelly, who is quite a mess. They find caves on the moon and get into their spacesuits and explore the caves, all five of them. And they find stalagmites and stalactites, which indicates some degree of water on the moon. 
they light a match to show that there's oxygen and suddenly the gravity gets to 1G when it shouldn't and one of the guys takes off his helmet because there might be oxygen there of course there might also be microorganisms there but that doesn't occur to the people in the movie because it's a dumb 1950 science fiction film one of the astronauts is a guy called Walt who is basically the arch capitalist he's really he has about 15 side hustles during the movie he has some uh, letters he wants stamped on the moon because they're going to be worth 200 bucks each if he gets them stamped. He's got his own cancellation stamp. He also has a few side hustles on the moon that he finds out about, one of which ends up getting him killed. Oh. While they're travelling through the caves, a couple of giant spiders fall from the ceiling on top of the astronauts, which is always a bit of fun. They're really groovy looking spiders, you know they're giant puppets, but it makes it a little more interesting that they're there. And all the astronauts get out their pocket knives and stab the spiders to death. Good times. So they get through the caves to another part of the moon where there's a sky with clouds, and the atmosphere of course, and a city in a crater. The telepathic control that the cat women have over Helen gets stronger while she's there, and they tell her to kind of romance. Sonny Tuff's character, even though she's actually in love with Victor Jory's character. So there's a love triangle which is mediated by telepathic cat women from the moon. So she sucks up to the captain who's as thick as a brick. Victor Jory's character kind of has been told by her before she has a telepathic influence that she loves him. And they get into a little bit of a fight when they're, what they should be doing is working out what these cat women have as an agenda and what they can do about getting their spacesuits back so they can return to the spaceship and return to Earth. Of course, we have Dancing Cat Women. They do a little production number, which wouldn't pass in a third-rate Las Vegas casino of the 1950s, but they do it anyway. They all have striking eye makeup and black leotards, and their hair's all kind of spiked up at the back. One of them falls in love with a human, because they always have to have one that falls in love with a human. The movie ends in a kind of dumb way, where the heroes shoot all the cat women and go back to Earth. Now, this one I, I like because Sonny Tufts is so bad. His acting and his characterization of the captain is kind of like a drunken sailor, which is not surprising given Sonny Tufts was indeed an alcoholic. But Marie Windsor and Victor Jury do a nice job of giving us the other two parts of the love triangle. They know what kind of movie it is and they give reasonable portrayals. And all credit to them for that. It's not easy to act in a movie like this and come out with your reputation intact. And I think both Victor Jury and Marie Windsor do. The budget looks like it's a bit higher than Fire Maidens from Outer Space was. And there's a bit more production value. The sets are a little more elaborate. The spacesuits, which I think are left over from Destination Moon, at least some of them are, are effective. And the Temples of the Moon are, are pretty reasonable. I've got the Hollywood version of it, which again I got from about 20 years ago. This one's not the best. There has been a more recent and better release than this, but this is the one I've got. I have a weird fondness for this one. I have a weird fondness for this movie. I don't know why. It's a mystery to me. But I do. And I, I like it. I think it's fun. I think it doesn't outstay as welcome. It tells the story. And even though they couldn't figure out a spectacular ending for it. I wasn't grumpy when I finished watching it. The third movie is from 1958. And it is Queen of Outer Space. Which is a hoot. Now... This is the movie that was parodied for parts of Amazon Women on the Moon. And that in itself is kind of funny because Queen of Outer Space is a parody. It's a parody of the kinds of movies the first two movies I've mentioned were. And it's great. It's in CinemaScope, Color by Deluxe, widescreen format. And it does some weird and interesting things. The cast is interesting in a way. You've got Eric Fleming playing the space captain. I've spoken about him before on the channel when I was talking about the Wagon Train DVD set. He played Gil Favor, the boss of the Wagon Train. And in this one, he plays a space captain. And he is as stiff as a piece of ebony. The movie looks good. It reuses some costumes from Forbidden Planet and also some ray gun props. And that makes me nostalgic to rewatch Forbidden Planet. The other characters are, are kind of interesting. Jar Jar Gabor plays a Venusian scientist who helps the heroes when they get to Venus. Now, if you're going to think scientist in any 1950s actress, the last person you're going to think of 
is either Marilyn Monroe or Zsa Zsa Gabor, but she plays a Venusian scientist, which I think is part of the joke. The other person is a character actor called Paul Birch, who turned up in some low-budget Roger Corman films in the 1950s. I remember him mostly for a Canadian TV series he did for one season in the late 50s with William Campbell called Cannonball, which was about long-distance truck drivers. So seeing Paul Birch in this one made me nostalgic for the kinds of TV shows I watched as a very young child. The movie does some interesting things. One of the things it does to make its spaceship look better is it takes some stock footage in colour of a missile launch and changes the aspect ratio so that the spaceship looks squatter and fatter. Gives it an interesting look, except when they cut to the scene with the palm trees. The launch is framed between two palm trees, and the palm trees look about as tall as aloe vera plants. Again, that could be part of the joke. And there's an interesting scene at the start with the rocket launchers taking the astronauts to the imaginatively named Space Station A. You see the rocket launcher, and you see the girlfriend of one of the astronauts, played by a woman called Joy Lansing. And it feels like she's standing way too close to the spaceship launch because she gets blasted by the wind of the rocket launching, which is, again, something quite funny. The screenplay for this was written by a couple of really fine writers. The first one is Ben Hecht, who wrote a number of good scripts in Hollywood in the 1930s, particularly things like The Front Page, for instance. He also wrote the screenplay for the original Scarface. So, really fine screenwriter. So he teamed up with a guy who knew science fiction pretty well because he was buddies with both Richard Matheson and Ray Bradbury, a guy called Charles Beaumont, who unfortunately died at the age of 38 of a thing called Pick's disease, which is a premature kind of dementia. And he had quite a tragic ending, but before that, he was a fine screenwriter. But in this one, he knows that this is a parody and he plays it up wonderfully in the script. And the actors playing it so seriously makes it even funnier. So what happens is they're about to go up to Space Station A when a whole bunch of beams from outer space start zooming around. One of them takes out the space station and one of them damages the spaceship. All of the crew pass out and they wake up having crash landed on Venus. And they're surprised because Venus is supposed to be very hot and totally alien to human life. But it turns out to be a little bit of a jungle paradise populated again by women because the queen of venus basically put all of the men into a gulag and all of the women are her servants for reasons and she wears a, a very elaborate mask and we all know why she wears the mask they have to be too smart to know the reason why after being captured by the venusian women the heroes end up back at the palace because there's always a palace or one city on a planet like this and the queen of outer space starts macking onto Eric Fleming's character. Her name, by the way, is Queen Ilyana. And she wears an elaborate mask and she looks like she was fitted out by Hollywood costume designers like all of the other women are. They're all wearing short skirts and tunics. They look like they're modelling for season one Star Trek, the original series, yeoman costumes, basically. Um, really fun. They're all in different colours, but we don't know what the colours mean apart from the fact that they probably suit their skin tones. Jar Jar Gabor's character Talia is part of the underground and she gets the men to help her basically overthrow Queen Ilea before she can aim her enormously powerful disintegrator at Earth and blow it away for no real good reason. Now the sets on this are kind of basic and slightly abstract but I like that and it looks like the most of the budget was spent on the costuming basically but it looks good it looks really good the actors aren't particularly great apart from paul birch who gives some groundedness to his older and shorter male scientist the queen is played by a woman called laurie mitchell who's, who's pretty good as the disfigured queen and that's not really a spoiler to say that again you've got that trope that hollywood had for a long time that anybody with a disfigurement or a physical disability was usually a baddie and that kind of lazy writing was all over 20th century literature and movies Ian Fleming used it about a dozen times with his villains she got burned by radiation because she was messing around with radiation to build her ray gun 
and the other characters posit the possibility that the radiation has also driven her insane and then you've got that technological wtf thing with a lot of science fiction movies where the science is so powerful they can have a ray reach from venus to earth and they can control spaceships and they've got disintegrators but none of them have plastic surgery but again this is a parody of a certain kind of science fiction movie and you've got to allow for that and when i said that the budget was mostly spent on the costumes in fact it was because the costumes that Jar Jar Gabor's character wears were $15,000 each and were designed by Edith Head, the famous Hollywood costume designer. If they hadn't gone a little less on the costume budget and a little more on the sets and leaned in just a bit harder into the comedy of this, it might have become more of a classic than it is, even though it is a camp classic. And there's a great line that Jar Jar Gabor's character Talia has, where she gets a little bit angry and says, I hate that queen, which has become a meme among certain groups of people in the many decades since the movie came out. I like this one most of all because once you realise right at the start that it's got its tongue firmly in its cheek, you can just sit back and enjoy it. The fact that Joy Lansing's character at the start is dressed up like she's about to go to a nightclub rather than seeing her boyfriend off on a spaceship trip to a space station. All of that over-the-top stuff and all of that campy stuff is kind of understated, but it's definitely there. Again, this is one you could watch while you're self-medicating and have a really good time of it. Not that I'm recommending that people mess with themselves, but on a Saturday night, if you're going to have a chill for a shandy, you could do worse than putting this one on and just having a good laugh with a few friends. It is very entertaining. The upshot at the end where you expect things to go wrong just as the Queen is about to blast Earth to smithereens. The disintegrator ray just has a glitch. And it blows up and blows the Queen up and everybody lives happily ever after. It's a mad film. It's a fun film. It's enjoyable. And watching all three of these together shows a progression from low-budget crap to mid-budget kind of has some virtue to it to more budget but a parody of the first two kinds of films now at the start of the video i said that this is actually a different kind of film it is these three movies are not at their essence science fiction what they are is lost jungle kingdom movies that happen to be on other planets all of those movies going back as far as h rider haggard sheep so it is that H. Roger Hager thing, going to the Lost Empire, finding a woman in a position of power who has, in some ways, supernatural abilities, and bringing down her empire. But all three of these are lost jungle civilization movies on other planets. And having said that, they're still fun, and I enjoy them a lot, and I think you should watch them. So that's it for this time around. Thanks a lot for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and leave a comment. You can become a channel member as well and get access to a few extras. I'll leave a link to that in the description of the video. You can also support the channel by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash terrytalksmovies. Next up, I've got the next in my alphabetical hidden gem movie listings. We're up to Q, R, and S. Though I may just do Q and R. It's still up in the air what I'm going to do with that. But I'm looking forward to doing that. And we're getting towards the end of the alphabet. And I've got to find something new to do when we hit the end of the alphabet. But leave that with me. I've got plenty of time to think about it. But until next time, watch some good movies. Watch some bad movies. Watch some movies where pretty much every woman wears a miniskirt. And I'll catch you next time.